I mean, uh, in a similar fashion the last time. I thought she was doing pretty good. Well, Wait five minutes. Yeah. Not long after you know. Yeah, she is. She's doing okay. Call this meeting of the uh, Dam and Bridge Committee to order at four o'clock. Welcome everyone. In December. Uh, confirmation, confirmation of the agenda. The North Huron uh, uh, Bridge and Dam Committee hereby accept the agenda for the January 22nd, 2020 committee meeting as presented. I will move it. I'll move that. Uh, Mitch and seconder. Rob, uh, all in favor? Carried. Uh, declaration of uh, pecuniary interests. Seeing none. Uh, minutes of the previous meeting, the North Huron, Huron, North Huron House and Bridge and Dam Committee hereby adopt the meeting minutes held for held on December the 18th, 2019, as presented. Do I have a mover? Uh, Ralph, or Sender, and Cedric. All in favor? Pass. This afternoon's de delegations, I.1. We have uh, Richard Hall and uh, Greg uh, Buchanan of the Lions Club of Wingham. Can you present for me? Sure, that'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, my name is uh, Lion Richard Hall. I'm the, the present um, uh, president of the Lions Club of Wingham, and with me is Lion Greg Buchanan. And at a meeting of Tuesday, December the 10th, of uh, 2019, we uh, formed a position on the House and Dam. We uh, approve its um, uh, its renovation and uh, and rest restoration. And so I'll just take a few minutes to out outline some of our reasons for that. Uh, one reason is to uh, beautify the committee. Uh, we envy communities like, for example, Roxeter. When you approach it on the highway, it looks very nice. I know my eyes are always drawn to the pond and everything that they've got there. Um, we ask the question, why are most cottages valued retreats of rejuvenation and relaxation? Because most of them are near water. Why do photos or sketches of towns and buildings often incorporate water if it's available? Because water represents the peace in the midst of our busy lives. We are all drawn to water. Why do people with lakeside property turn their Muskoka chairs towards the water rather than towards the buildings in the woods? Because water has a magnetic attraction to us. It gives us peace and is conducive to quiet and contemplation. Most people in Wingham cannot afford a cottage, but a pond would make the benefits of a large body of water available for all of us in our community. Great. Right? My name is Greg Buchanan. Um, I spent my most of my early years here in town till about age 19, and I'm living here again since about 2006, and joined the Lions Club, obviously. The uh, second point in our letter to the uh, committee, restoring the pond would provide increased recreational opportunities to Wingham and District. As a youngster growing up in this town, um, spring or summer recreation consisted pretty much of going to the ball diamond to play ball or go for a swim. There was no soccer in those days. Uh, we could go to several places for swimming, first bush and McLean's side road. Even I remember going out on the old railway tracks to London Bridge. But the best place of all was Housen's Dam for swimming. We could swim on both sides. Of, of that dam. Um, soon after the spring runoff calmed down a bit, we'd, we'd be down there, climb up on the wall near the old light standard and jump in to the uh, foaming water below and then try and swim back up and get onto the floor of the bay. <laughs> jump back in on the on the floor of the, the stream. The one, one area was always busy, you know, they would control it. You just fly out there and then try and swim back up. On the other side, we had this beautiful pond, and uh, we often would swim there up to what we knew then of those days as Mackenzie Bridge. I guess it's been replaced today with Hannah Bridge. Mackenzie Bridge was a steel girder, single lane, 
bridge for, the, for a highway of all things, and uh, we climb up on that or even on to the, what we called the crotch when you had the girders, we'd jump out of the crotch, swim back to the dam. We were all in awe of one, one fellow, maybe some of you remember him, Des Brophy was the only guy I knew that jumped off the very top. <laughs> <laughs> we never did. <laughs> I don't know anyone else who did. While I was not here as a resident, I guess there was an awful lot of activity on and around the pond. Um, boating, I remember seeing a ski jump, so there must have been water skiing, uh, canoeing and kayaking, fishing, swimming of course. There were canoe lessons, uh, swimming lessons of course. Uh, there'd be picnic lunches and just sitting, just sitting on the benches, enjoying the beautiful view of the pond. I'm sure if we were able to restore this dam, a lot of those activities would come back. People would come, the local people and people from out of town, would once again enjoy that area if, if, if it's at all possible. Um, those activities and, and probably more. I'm not so sure about motorized watercraft today. Today's high, sp high powered speed boats and wave runners and sea dews don't think they're good for an enclosed area like a pond, but we'd have to see. Third item on our, on our listing, on our letter, restoring the pond would restore the history of the community as the pond was an institution of William before the dam was let go. Um, the pond and the dam it was an institution. William probably became the settlement because of the power that we could harness on the river and, and uh, construct dams, produce build mills, sawmills, feed mills. We even had uh, uh, hydro at one time in London, in, in Wingham. <clears throat> I can remember um, hydro up during the war years, and I think probably 45 or 46, we outgrew the capacity and went with uh, Ontario Hydro. Um, there was a mill race uh, off the lower dam. I guess that was eventually filled in. The lower dam was uh, washed out. There was actually a great pond there too, a beautiful area behind that dam. Not many of us maybe can remember. Sorry for taking uh, a pause. Um, I can remember uh, buildings still in, in existence for that hydro generation. I think the last building was just torn down the last couple of years. In the same vein of uh, the history of the community, it was just a few short weeks ago I read in the local paper, uh, in the remembering section of 1920, 100 years ago today, and uh, one of the items said, Death Roll, Thomas Gregory. One by one the settlers of Wingham are crossing the river to, the heavenly, to their heavenly rest on on Christmas Day, Thomas Gregory passed away at the ripe old age of 87. They had a way of writing in those days. Uh, um, just another part of that. The late Mr. Gregory was a contractor and grain buyer. <clears throat> it was he who built the dam and flour mill, 
with the Housen and Housen Mills now stands. Besides being a great worker, he was a public spirited man and different times held mayor's position, Reeves' position, deputy Reeves' position. The next item in there is concerning the buying the equipment for the hydro generation that we just mentioned. So that would have started in about 1920 and I guess lasted for around 25 years before it was discontinued. Fourth item, restoring the dam would enhance aesthetic and recreational benefits for the Muskrat Festival, which is held in the same vicinity. Um, I remember early on when I first became a lion, um, we built, uh, contributed building to a cardboard boat to, in order that the lions could race in the, in the race at the, at the festival. I think we did that for a couple of years and then the um, water became too, too low to even float a boat. So if restoration were to take place, the larger pond, higher water levels, they could enjoy those kind of events again and bring people to our town. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And the fifth point is, um, and something that we're interested in as a Lions Club, as we're a, a service club and fundraising club, is it would increase options for fundraising. A couple things that just come to mind, uh, there's one Lions Club that has rubber duck races and that's their main source of fundraising. Um, we could do that. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind for me is when I was in Alaska they had the um, ice thaw raffle going on and that's their main fundraiser to raise funds for the Iditarod sled dog race. So, you know, that would be another option um, that we could, uh, we could use to raise funds and the funds always go back into the community. So, those are our five points. Uh, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present. If fundraising is required as a fundraising group, we would certainly do our part. Um, might say too that many projects uh, require exploration, um, you know, in terms of what the benefits are going to be and so forth. That piece is already in place since we have 150 years uh, history of, of the, the dam and the pond being a valued thing in our community. So we're hoping that um, in the not too distant future we might be able to restore the dam and the pond because we believe uh, in a very real way that the, uh, the pond and, uh, and the dam are very much a, a part of the heart and the soul of our community. Thank you very much. Uh, if you guys uh, just want to hang on, there might be some questions. Uh, go ahead, Sonny. If I may, Chair. Um, you guys, you the Lions Club is supporting restoration of the dam. Mm -hmm. Does that mean both whether it can be repaired or if it has to be completely rebuilt? I'm or not if it's uh, replacement is not, not being supported? I'm not an engineer, so I'll leave those things up to somebody else. Just whatever it takes to make a, a walking bridge and dam across the river as it used to be so people can enjoy that. Uh, you can walk across the train bridge, but you're way up high. This would allow people to walk across being closer to the water. But uh, also the main thing is the pond uh, that would be um, reinstituted behind the dam. Okay, so you're not against replacement. No, I, I mean whatever it takes to uh, to get the job done. Just Craig, that's thank you for speaking. For no, no, that's I concur. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, thank you. Our uh, next delegation is uh, Doug uh, Kivenhoven, the chair of the Wigan BIA. Well, Doug. Thank you. Committee members, uh, the, the Wing of BIA uh, was asked for input regarding the future of the house and dam, and this letter is in response to those requests. Uh, the, BIA, the Wing of BIA board sent an email to all of its members uh, requesting their input uh, so that the board uh, could provide a valid input. At the general meeting on the morning of January the 9th, 2020, the members in attendance were asked for their input. Um, after being brought up to date by a report from Sean McGee that provided input from engineers on the state of the house and dam, 
kind of four options. That is do nothing, decommission, repair, or replace. The attendees agreed that the most financially and environmentally responsible option is to decommission the dam, have it removed, and make the area aesthetically pleasing. The BIA feels that the costs to repair or replace the structure are far too expensive for any value that would be achieved. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Mr. Governor? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, actually, Mr. Chair, I have one. So just the position, it's, it's the, the value wouldn't be there to replace it. I guess I'm just trying to feel that out a bit because I think the 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 um, intent is is to fundraise for that. So it'd be you know basically private money going into it, not public money. Mm -hmm. So is I guess so with that in mind, it, to, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'll ask for a clarification. Is it basically saying that the members of the BA wouldn't be interested in participating in fundraising for for a restoration replacement of the dam? That was the, I would say that's basically where we arrived. Yes, the the cost um, versus the uh, the benefits um, just didn't seem within we're not within reality. So okay, yeah, and and it wasn't it was also the but the um, environmental side of things, right? That um, dams are not something that are getting built, uh, and uh, a lot of them are being decommissioned. So from an environmental point of view, you know, fisheries and, and so on. Uh, we're not dealing with all the, the facts, but this is the sense mm -hmm. that we uh, have from the, uh, the BI board and the members that we, that we uh, got input from. Okay, Mr. McBride. Your, uh, <clears throat> Doug, the cost information that you received, where did you get that from? From the report, from the... Uh, from the KGS report? <coughs> the, the summary report that uh, Sean McGee uh, presented to mm -hmm. the council in May. Those, those cost estimates are pretty low level or pretty high level, whichever way you want to look at it. They're not very detailed. And, and what about your environmental information? Where are you getting environmental responsibility? Where is that information coming from? I don't think the, uh, the uh, Maiton Valley Conservation Authority um, uh, is, is, is uh, I mean, I'm not dealing with facts, uh, Andy. I'm, I'm okay. dealing with what I've heard through mm -hmm. different sources. And so the sense is, and I, you know, I could be corrected, but the sense is that Maitland Valley Conservation is not keen on the house and dam remaining there for flood, flood issues. Um, and there was the Ontario Rivers uh, or something like that, that that wrote a letter saying, you know, we, we, they would oppose the dam. They would like to see the dam removed as well. So I think times have changed, and um, uh, I think that's where we're we're at from back in the history to where we are today now. That's and how good a cross section of your uh, membership would you say you you're representing here? We offered them uh, opportunity to give input and to come to by email and uh, and and to attend a meeting, and so and then in the end, the board meets together uh, and, and writes a letter. So uh, we did the best that we could to, um, uh, to, to, give, yeah. to what's your answer? You have 100 members, you're representing 10 of them, or you don't know? <laughs> okay. Thank we you, Mr. Chairman. We could. Thank you. Item 5.3, uh, uh, Bill Trick, you see with us? Okay. Uh, small power generation. Uh, Mr. Trick is a retired engineer with uh, hydroelectric experience. And we discussed the practical issues he sees related to the installation of small uh, water power generation at the uh, Wingham Dam. Yeah, yeah sit down here. Sure. So you prefer. <coughs> Welcome, Bill. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to speak on this matter. Um, I am retired. I have spent 50 years as a professional engineer in Ontario, and uh, I've worked in different capacities, including manufacturing, and then uh, a number of years as a consultant. Uh, and then the last period of my time, we I had a partner who reformed a company, 
and we built three hydroelectric plants, which we owned. And uh, we operated those for a number of years and finally sold them out. And uh, I guess I retired at that point. Um, <coughs> I would start, just to say how I got started on this, uh, Jeff Graham, I, back in 2016, I believe, was doing some work for you on an environmental assessment. And he was requesting opinions from the public in large. And at the same time, I know I'd been talking to Andy as well. And uh, <coughs> so I sent him a note. And I suggested that if they're doing this assessment, uh, they should consider also the social implications and, uh, and the future of the, of the energy <coughs> business. And that they should probably look at considering installing a water power at site at the dam if they were considering repairing it. At that time, the, uh, the costs of repairing the dam was talked around half a million dollars with an annual maintenance cost of some $20,000 or $25,000 a year on an ongoing basis. And I, when I took a look at the dam again and the flows, I, I suggested that <coughs> it would probably support a 200 kilowatt unit installed there. And uh, I can go into it more detail, but basically that would generate around a million kilowatt hours a year. And at that same time, Ontario Hydro was offering, uh, under a subsidized rate, close to 25 cents a kilowatt hour. And that would have represented about a quarter of a million dollars a year. And, <coughs> and then I, so I said, considering that, it's probably worthwhile looking into doing some hydro there because there was uh, that amount of money over a 40-year contract is a lot of money. And uh, anyhow, that's... That's where I uh, first got my insight into, it, or my, my start on this. And I've not committed, I've not been to any meetings since, and uh, I have spoken to Andy a couple of times on, but nothing more than that. Uh, that's the only formal presentation I made. Uh, so time has gone by, and uh, what happened, I guess, was that Interior Hydro, with a new political leader in place, uh, decided they're not going to pay any power, any, any, they're not going to buy any power at all. So the 25 cents went to basically to zero. And in fact, as far as I know, they're not signing any contracts at all, um, other than they possibly allow you to do some net billing. <coughs> and we can go into that a little bit later. But uh, at the same time, when I put in that letter to Jeff, I said, you should also consider possibly recombining the sites. Now, the lower dam is gone. But that head ahead had developed about 14, 12 to 14 feet ahead, whereas the top site was about 9. And if you could develop <coughs> that again by running a pipe down and combining the heads, you could be talking a sizable amount of power, like four or 500 kilowatt hours. Again, that increases the, uh, the revenue from the site or whatever the, whatever the power is used for, is, which now remains up, up in the air. Um, I, as I say, I can go into the details of why I think it's around a million kilowatt hours. It's, uh, as I say, I'm no longer an engineer, so I can't give you formal numbers, but uh, I've, I've done a lot of this through my life. Uh, I've uh, uh, just, as I say, in the 50 years I've worked, I've worked entirely in, in small hydro. And uh, I, my first 10 years, in fact, I worked, I was the engineer at the barber company, which made the turbines, which were installed at your, at your hydro plant. That was installed in 1908 and also supplied the turbines to the house and mill and also the uh, turbines that went into your pumping plant. So that is an old, old company, but uh, that particular year, just out of curiosity, that particular year, that plant, or that company installed seven hydroelectric stations that one year and about 10 or 11 other installations of water power on, for, for mills, for chopping mills and sawmills. That's a very active number, of, a great many <laughs> installations, and it was a small company with uh, uh, basically 30 or 40 people at most. Anyway, that's, uh, that just shows you how active things were at that time and how important hydro was to the local people, how important it was to get some electricity. Now, I'd also point out that, that they weren't in fact the first installation. There was always installations at the dam site down there before that, and because I can remember on the notes, that was in the barber notes on this that said we've replaced a number of old turbines. That was in 1908. So I don't know how many turbines have been installed in that plant through the years in that area, but it's uh, as soon as you settle in an area, it was at that time, you only settle where you get water power because you build a sawmill, a flour mill, whatever, whatever you need was the power. That's what you settled the town near, and that's possibly why Bingham has settled here. 
That's why Walkerton is still at Walkerton, because Walkerton was the walker was the was the man that built the turbine, installed the first power at Walkerton. And anyway, I was just going to say that that um, I, uh, I, I'm not making a formal presentation here. As I, I didn't quite know what I was going to need, going to need to do here when I, when I until I read the agenda here. Um, I say that it's quite possible. Well, I was just going to be uh, following up the the previous speaker on this. I said I've, I've done work in numbers in number of different countries. I've worked in South America. I've worked in uh, China. I've worked in Nepal. I've worked in Dominican Republic. Lots of work in the states and some in Canada too. But I just say that. There's not many countries that you've worked in, and that I know of, that destroy a water power site. Not many, other than the United States and Canada. And I sort of think it's a crime for us to take and destroy a water power site that could provide that power in perpetuity, with the, what I say to be minimum impact on the, on the society around it, other than power. So I'd point out that maybe you should look a little bit longer term on, on these dams as well. And uh, that, that's my own opinion. Now, I was going to say here as well, if you do install this turbine, and I'd say it's technically quite possible to do it. I brought along a couple of sketches here and, uh, and some brochures, and I'll leave them with whoever wants to see them, because it defines basically what you need about a, a, a four and a half foot diameter runner, or 100, 150, 140 millimeter runner, and that can fit within a certain block, and I've given those, I'll give a little sketch of the size of the block, and it's also in the brochure just to get an indication of how much you need to do to put that turbine in there. And it's not an immense amount. It's a, it's a block which is, I don't know whether you fellows are all metric or imperial, but it's 13 feet wide and about 52 feet long. You can imagine a basement of a house or of a double garage would be the space that that would require. And when we get to the final end of this thing, if, if it turns out that you can't rationalize building the hydro now, well, then I would say at least if you repair the dam, you should make provision for that in the future, even some stop logs and whatever, so that when the day comes or the politics change or energy becomes more expensive, a lot of things can change, and uh, then you could go ahead and install the turbine when the time is right. Um, <coughs> it doesn't come free, though. There's, uh, I was going to point out that if you do make use of the dam and you install a turbine there, you have to maintain the head to get the best energy. It's going to be a run of the river plant because you can't use peaking plants anymore. In the old days, when they had a sawmill or a gristmill, uh, they'd, run the, they'd run the mill during the daytime because that's when people usually work because they didn't have lights. And at nighttime, they'd pond the water up in the dam. And then they could sit, run the water through the turbine in the daytime and serve the, serve the public. So. That's why some of these sites are installed larger than we would today. We're now looking in this situation with a run of the river plant where the turbine is generating power night and day. And it has to match, uh, it, it can't, it has to let water spill over when, when there's floods because you can't afford to put a great big turbine in that's only going to operate a few days of the year. You have to have, a, there's an optimum size and that all has to be adjudicated and reviewed. It's based on the water flow data of the stream and the head and the characteristics of the turbine. There's good water flow data for this site. It's upstream, there's a water, there's a gauge upstream so you can get good data for that. You then look at that data, an engineer looks at it, not me, but an engineer looks at that, puts it into a spreadsheet and he puts in his turbine efficiency and determines what's the best option and what's the best size to install at that site. And it may or not be, as I said, one, one million kilo hours, but it's not far off because I've done a lot of these myself. So. The other thing is, as I say, you have to maintain the head. So that means you've got to have somebody there in flood time. You're going to have to have somebody, whether it be the operator or the, whoever owns the plant, or whatever your deal you make, that person has to be available sometimes to pull the stop log because if you don't have flooding. You can't pull the dam down in the fall and wait for it to water and, and, and escape the flood that way, which has been sort of the characteristics of some of the conservation authority policies. So if you're going to get useful energy out of this thing, you're going to have to plan on having people look after the dam. There's maintenance required, and you have to also be concerned that there might be things like ass, ice problems. There may be, uh, you've got to clean the trash rocks. So none of this stuff comes without, without attention and, and, uh, and cost. But nevertheless, uh, I, there's a lot of options how this can be done, but I'd say that you must remember that those things have to be maintained and uh, that the equipment has to be looked after. 
So if you own it or you buy something, you, have, you sell the site to somebody else to let them look after it, then there has to be conditions go with the sale. If you want to own the dam and, and lease it out to somebody else, then these conditions all have to be met. And uh, that's something that, uh, that you have to decide what you want to do. Uh, I say that you can't sell the power to the grid anymore with our new government. That may change, it may not change, I don't know. Uh, Ontario Hydro and, and uh, the government of Ontario are up to their ears in debt and I'm not sure that they're willing to, so, uh, to uh, subsidize electricity, even in the name of, of green power. So uh, that's, that's, that's up in the air. You can, as far as I know yet, and I still think it's in place, you can use what they call net billing. Now net billing means that you connect to the grid and when you can generate, you generate, but you dissipate or you, you use that to displace power in your, uh, that you would otherwise buy. So if you're a, a, a business or a company or, or the town that's using a sub substantial amount of power, you can put power into the system and that's, that's metered both ways and, uh, and at the end of the year they tally up the, really, up the, the meters and if you, use, if you generate more power than you've used, then they net out that amount, but they don't pay you for anything that's surplus. That's not paid for up in Ontario. On the other hand, if you generate less power than your utility uses, whoever, wherever it's connected to, then you completely displace the amount of energy that you've displaced. You get, you get paid for it. It's subtracted off your, your annual, your annual uh, bill. As far as I know, up to 500 kilowatts, that's still possible to do in Ontario. And uh, I'm not <coughs> sure that that will ever be changed. Uh, it seems a sensible thing to do. I also brought along here, and I've, I've got some notes I'm going to leave. I brought along as well what I mentioned about the net billing, but I've also brought along something from Idaho Power, which is a, a company I know. And uh, they've got a net billing solution as well, but they're willing to pay for that surplus power that's generated. And uh, they're under review of that because they don't think it's maybe quite so fair for the other ratepayers because they're, they're, uh, they're actually paying people for surplus power and some of these, some of these people with their, with their solar panels and uh, with their windmills are actually making that a business and they're generating literally more than they're using and that wasn't the intention, they were just going to use it to dissipate. Anyway, I brought along a, a bit of a write-up for that and I'll leave, I'll leave this with you, with whoever you, do, <laughs> you direct me to leave it to. So, that's something that you might want to consider, whether or not you want to do net billing. Um, I also brought along, just, just uh, in, 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 because I think you should have an idea of what, <coughs> what, of what involved with doing this in terms of building the power plant and all, I brought along some, a brochure here with a little sketch in it, which shows the, uh, the um, a particular turbine that would fit in there, as I say, a full Kaplan-type turbine, which has got adjustable blades and adjustable wicket gates, uh, has very high efficiency. You can turn it way down to about 25% of its rated load until you get high efficiency, which is good for streams like we have here, where you're dealing with substantial peak flows and substantial low flows in the summertime. You get the best energy if you've got a turbine that will adjust, will modulate to, make, to match that flow. So I brought along a little brochure that I can I'll leave with whoever you tell me to, and. Uh, <coughs> I'd say that that's that could be a basis for your for your start <coughs> of doing estimating and what it would cost to install this thing. Uh, now, as I said, you could look at you could look at using the power yourself as a net biller. There's also another company called Bullfrog Power. Now, you may not have heard of Bullfrog Power, but Bullfrog Power is the company which buys power from green sources, and it sells it to people like Canadian Tire and some of the people that want to buy green power. So they add it to their bill and green power, then, then they can say I'm also using 10% or 5% or 2% of my total billing is green power. And they can put that on their little brochures and they can put that on the advertising on the front door. So Bullfrog Power is in business quite a while and they're buying power from, uh, uh, from windmills, they're buying it from, I don't know about solar panels, but they're certainly buying it from windmills and they're buying it from hydro. So that would be something that you could approach to see if, if they were willing to buy some power. Now they're not, probably not in the business of financing your hydro, but if you did get it financed one way or another, they would probably be willing to, to give you a price. Um, 
Now, I think as well, I don't know they've talked to Greenbug again, but they might well be, I don't think they're interested in building the plant anymore as they once were, because the 25 cents has disappeared, and if you don't have that in, to back you up, you're not going to be able to, to uh, finance it, but they, you might still approach them to see if they're willing to take it on as a, as a project where they would look at an engineering procurement construction management basis. And I've, I've left the, uh, the address, the address is here, Bullfrog Power, got on a sheet, which I'll leave. I've got Integral manufacturers of similar turbines to this. This, is, this turbine, in fact, is made in Germany, or I think it's Germany, it's actually Vis. Uh, but they've got dealers in Montreal. I'll leave that as well. And I've got names of two companies as well in Ontario, in fact, that build these turbines. Uh, they're both over eastern Ontario. And I've got their names and addresses and so on and also Greenbug here. So I, I'm just going to leave that here as well. Um, am I making myself clear or not? Or is, is it, am I doing all right? I'm a little bit weak in my speaking here today, but, and I'm not particularly organized. So uh, I'm just saying that I don't think it's wise to destroy any water power. I'll probably leave it at that. Uh, if there's questions, that's fine. I'd like to answer them too. And as I, just to point out that the last plant that we built, which was a small one, was the, uh, the one at Maple Hill, which is just the side of Hanover. And that is on a low head dam. It's about nine to 10 foot head, much the same as you've got here. And it's about three, a little over three times the flow. So that, uh, when, when we built that, of course I did the homework on it. And we ended up with about 3.2 million kilowatt hours is what we expected to get from that plant. And it's got a little over three times the flow. So if you take a third of that, we end up with one million kilowatt hours on your site. And I can do it another way as well. The old plant downstream was 180 kilowatts. And uh, if you ran that year round, you'd be in at times about 60%, which is the annual capacity factor. You'd be end up with a million bucks or a million kilowatt hours a year too. And I just was going to finish, it's not all free power because the water power rental on a million kilowatt hours a year, which you got to pay to the province, just like your auto license, I guess, it's going to cost 3800 bucks a year right now. That's the water power rental you pay that for the problems. What? Because you, you don't own the water. <laughs> okay. I think that's it. Thank you. And as I say, I'll give a file here to whoever wants it at the end here. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I have a question. What was the approximate cost of that Maple Hill installation? About 3000 bucks a kilowatt. And uh, that was done in 1990. And uh, I, I, I'm not going to speculate what this would cost because it's, I've not done the homework and, uh, and I don't have a reason to do the homework. So I, I'd say that's open for somebody else. You can, you can get an estimate of the machinery, you, have to, you can follow up the details here, the people that make these things, you can, you know, they'll probably give you a cost of the turbine directly. Uh, you can give Andy a good, <laughs> give, a, give, a, give a little assignment to Andy there to, uh, Estimate the silver cost because, as I said, I've shown it's a, it's a box which is, a, what did I say, 13 feet wide and 52 feet long and about uh, 19 feet high. That's from down below the tail, the headwater level, and that's what the turbine would fit in and the generator. So it's, uh, you can put your arms around that. It's a, it's a double, it's a foundation for a double sized garage. And I'd say if you do something, you fix the dam, but you decide not to build the hydro. Make sure you have the engineer make some provision in the new dam where you can put a stop logs in and block it off, but he can then build something into it later on. Because I've seen many cases where we're trying to do something in a, in a dam where the brand new dam built and you've got to start destroying it to put an installation in. Okay? Um, I know, I Any more questions? I have a couple of questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you know of uh, uh, who do you have to uh, get approvals for for a power dam, and is it different oh, if it's yeah. privately owned or mm -hmm. municipally owned? What, what we're faced with, I mean, uh, I, I built these plants uh, in, in the 1990, and even then we were getting regulatory overload, and I think it's worse today, and. I, uh, so you're saying they might not give you approval in today's market? Well, you, it, it becomes kind of very costly because you're dealing with water permits, you're dealing with industry, natural resources, environment, 
everybody wants to say something about water because it affects the fishing, it affects the swimming, it's, uh, and it affects the scenic, the scenic beauty of the salt. There's, when we were building one of our plants up, up in, uh, on the North Shore, which is a five megawatt station, on about 50 foot ahead, uh, and then we had public meetings and uh, somebody chirped up and says, I represent a million canoeists. He represents a million canoeists and I don't want them to build. Now, I don't know if he represented a million canoeists, I don't believe it, but still, people like that can cause you lots of trouble. And it's not a realistic problem. I mean, uh, that wasn't a realistic objection. My uh, second question I had was, uh, what if any difference in standards uh, does the government request that you build, build to that might be different from just building a standard water dam? Is there, is there a higher standard to power generation that they require you to build to, being a municipality, no. not being a private? That, that, that I'm speaking a bit out of turn, maybe Andy can add too, but I'd say as far as the dam is concerned, you have to go through a lot of red tape to, to build or repair a dam. Lakes and Rivers Improvement Act and uh, environmental assessments and all the rest of it has to be done. To add to that the complexity of another power plant, I don't think is a whole lot more. Uh, you've got water, you have to water a water taking permit, which is which is in addition to the the dam, that would could be a bit of a problem. But uh, when you're dealing with a, a run of the river plant, you're not dealing with a peaking plant. Run of the river plant is somewhat easier because you're really not changing the you're not changing the head level in the dam. You're running constantly and practice improving it. So I say that it shouldn't make much difference, much more difficulty to build a hydro dam in there, and put a hydro plant in compared to just repairing the dam. Is there, I've seen the commercials where if you have a hydro uh, dam, mm -hmm. uh, the government has put restrictions in of how far upstream and how far downstream you can get pedestrian or public close to the to the facility. They warn of water intake and water outgo, and they've, they've put, yeah. well, you don't have a lot of room that, that those, those conditions may end up making the pond not usable to the public. For well, I, 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 that's, that's a little bit new to me. I, I mean, I may be out of date on this, but uh, uh, you're going to have a set of trash rocks in front of the intake to the turbine to keep the debris out of the turbine. And, and you might well have a boom in front of that as well, which would keep logs and stuff <coughs> from floating into the turbine and divert them over the dam. Uh, but the plants that we built, uh, we had signage and that's it. We didn't have any fencing and metal. Again, I'm so <laughs> 20, 20 years out of date on this, so these, they can put in rules like this, and not about, about 15 years out of date, they can put rules like that in place and I, but I wouldn't know about it. But I mean, even the dam, even the dam in the spillway is deemed to be, to be deemed to be dangerous, and you have people go over a spillway and, and get drowned. So normally you would uh, you'd have fencing and uh, some level of signage and so on, uh, uh, even around the dam. Well, let me tell you that the Ministry of Natural Resources dams I've seen. Now again, I'm a bit out of date, but the ones I've seen never had very little protection. And you can look at the Manitoulin, you can look at any, any of the, they've got hundreds of dams around the country yet. And uh, a lot of them have no protection that I know of. Yeah. I'm going to make one last comment, if you've if you got time for me. Uh, I was going to say that there's a number of ways you could look at forming a way of getting this built. You might be able to do some towns like, like, like uh, Kaywan, for example. The town owned the dam. They rented the water from that dam on an annual basis, and there's a fellow who then put in the turbines, and he, and he generates power there through the year with certain conditions on drawdowns and all the rest of it, but he then pays a certain fee to the, to the town. There's other plants that have been built where they've completely sold the dam outright to a private operator. There's other dams which have been maintained by the Ministry of Natural Resources, and the water comes off the side, and there's another fee that's paid on that aside from the water power rental. So there's, there's a number of different schemes of, in place to handle the situation where you might want to keep the dam and you might want to also develop the power, but you may not want to have the power yourselves or you may not want to finance that, that hydro park yourself. So these sort of things you should, if you're curious about this, that'll have to be looked into. And those options, uh, 
set out and a, a, a good trip around uh, with one of your principals to these other places and see how they operate them would be a valuable trip. Do you know of a recent dam that's been put placed in the last, uh, recently a dam, dam that's been in pla put in place in the last uh, 15 years that we could contact? Not too many. No, I don't know. No one's put it in the last 20 years of no. putting no. in one. But we've got existing dams in place, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the town of Bracebridge, for example, has three of its hydro plants which they sold out to a private operator. And uh, Brinfrew has the dams they sold out, has power plants they sold out. Aurelia, they operate hydro yet, and quite often they've been selling the projects off, or they've been running them and, and leasing them and doing doing various things. So it's a bit of a small project for that sort of scheme of things, but. Uh, if you really want to do something that way, there's examples of how it can be done. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. What's what would you say is the average lifetime of a turbine setup? Um, well, the turbine itself lasts a long, long time unless the damage is done, and if you have proper trash racks, they're almost indefinite because you don't, you cannot overload a water turbine. It's designed for a certain head. It's not like a truck where you can put five tons in a two-ton truck. Water turbine, the maximum you get out of it is what the head is specified and wide open, and that's, that's all you're going to get. So it doesn't break down by overload. Sometimes it breaks down by, by destruction, or, as I say, by something, by carelessness or somebody uh, putting something, letting something get into the turbine. The generator has a useful lifetime, maybe 20, 30 years with a new mound. Uh, I have a turbine in my mill right now, which was built in 1867. Operable. And the other was, well, the other new one was built in 1920. And it's operating this very moment, generating my own power. Thank you. What was the first place you mentioned there, Bill? Hmm? The first town you mentioned that had. Oh, oh Kego, Kegawan, up in Manitoulin. Kegawan. Yeah, Kegawan. And I put a note down here that. In your opinion, it's certainly technically possible to install a pipe turbine system in at this site. I know nothing about the lay of the land, it, uh, other than I know there was two sites, yeah, and they had and you could combine the heads if you owned the you could put a pipe down and take it from the top down to the bottom and concentrate the head down there. Then you would double your output, and that become a sizable power plant. Then, but that would mean piping it from piping it from the one top site down, to the, the other down. site. And again, with the headworks at the front, at the, at the, the right. dam with the pipe. And in, in rough numbers, this sort of capacity, it's around five to six foot diameter pipe. And it could be any construction, plastic, steel, wood. You need two dams in there, would you? Well, no, you, no. you wouldn't build a dam at the bottom. You have the powerhouse you just, down. You just build the one dam and then, and then pipe, concentrate the head with the pipe oh, and you shoot. put the powerhouse at the bottom. And if you've got a warehouse, you already got a um, building down there. Maybe you can adapt it. I don't know. I don't know who, who owns the land. I mean, it, I know nothing about that. I'm just looking at it from a hydraulic standpoint. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. You're going to give that. Yes, I will. I'll, I'll do before I leave. Five point four. We have uh, Peter White on the rehabilitation of the existing asset. Welcome, Peter. It's an overview of the existing dam structure components, uh, limitations of uh, recent engineering studies, spillway configuration, flow capacities, um, uh, the new house and dam alternatives, uh, construction budgeting, and engineering services. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, to the committee members and, and members of the public. And thank you very kindly for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I'll just have to ask for some technical help, please. Uh, how do I advance the slides? There's a mouse. Okay. Um, yep, yeah, and you just click the right one. Great. Right Thank one. you. Thank you. We'll try to do that. The uh, I want to just give acknowledgement uh, here also to KGS and BM Ross, who contributed a lot of valuable information to the committee and to the township from all of their historical reports. So I've I've drawn from those reports, and my objective today is to distill the information that is in those reports. Um, the, the reports are quite uh, technical and they're quite uh, copious. There's a lot of words, diagrams, and so on. So my my struggle 
personally was to try to distill this information and draw conclusions from it, and that is what I will try to present to you today. So again, thanks to KGS and BM Ross for their for their work. And so let's right click and uh, sorry. Maybe try a left click. Okay. So there's a there's a left click. Um, Maybe I need to go up that little um, narrow on the right. So I'll let you show me. There we go. Okay, thank you so much for that. Good. So um, uh, the terms of reference as I was given, um, and, I, and again, I'm trying to uh, be respectful of where the committee is at, and to, again, to try to support um, you know the the work and the analysis that that you're doing. So this is my objective in being here today is to speak to your um, your uh, your your terms of reference and the uh, as as mentioned um, you know I'd, I'd like just to start by doing an overview of the existing structural components because you do have a complex uh, facility sitting out here in the river uh, there are some limitations of the recent engineering studies uh, the various studies that you have uh, uh, look at the leg of the elephant, other ones look at the uh, trunk of the elephant, others look at the ear of the elephant. So they're very good studies, they contain a lot of information, but none of them really look at all of the elephant together. So uh, as long as you understand that, that you should be a, a little bit cautious when you're looking at these existing studies. Um, I'd like to speak about the spillway configuration and flow capacity and I'd, I'd like just to try to explain how flow capacity is really important uh, as a consideration and it really ties into the risk and, and I believe when KGS and BM Ross talk about the risk of the structure they're either referring to like on a full flood condition when you have all this tremendous volume of water coming down the river all that water is putting tremendous force on the dam and when they say the dam is unstable it's perfectly stable on a beautiful winter's day like today it's not going anywhere but boy when the river's in flood and you've got that all that energy coming down the river that's when things could you know things could happen so this that's that's engineering risk we'll talk about that uh, I'd like to speak about the new house and dam alternatives that you restored because you've got many things ahead of you uh, you know, as you proceed, I'd like to speak about construction budgets. I'm not able to give you specific numbers to uh, dollars and pennies, but uh, we can put things in in proportions. And and then I'd I'd like to speak also about engineering <coughs> services that in this day and age are the requirements for anything you do uh, moving forward. And let me try to get my mouse back here. Here we come. So. Let's have a look at the structure. You have the 1920s structure with its two abutments, its three piers, the bridge over top. But also, you have the embankment that was inherited from your forefathers. And, and so that embankment is, a, is a, a, I think, a really important thing that should be looked at as, as critically as the, as the bridge and dam structure that you have. You also have the, the uh, 1960s uh, north uh, structure, and, and again, that's really, really important. So what, what, what I took away from the engineering reports, one report would look at a certain aspect, another report would look at a different aspect, but when you look at the whole thing together, you've, you've, I think you have some, some excellent opportunities to do whatever it is that you decide to do. So my encouragement is, when you're looking for your solutions and your remedies, please look at the entire structure you know, that, that you have and, and give appropriate weight to all of the elements. And I'll, I'll speak to that to, uh, here today. The, um, as it pertains to your north spillway structure, it, it is now over 50 years old. Uh, you asked the question uh, of this gentleman about the lifespan of, of you know, assets, hydro assets and so on. And, and typically, as engineers, we think something should be good for about 50 years. And when it gets to 50 years, somebody else is going to be looking at it and deciding what the future holds. 
So you're at that stage now with your north spillway structure. It, it needs to be looked at. Uh, it, the, the KGS and BMMOS reports, they tell you that the north spillway structure requires detailed engineering inspection and it requires stability analysis. It was absolutely uh, engineered properly in the 1960s, if that's not the question at all. Rules and regulations have changed and the, the, it, it's an asset that requires engineering studies and, and there may be operational things, but I mean, it, it, the engineering reports say that this needs inspection and stability analysis. And the reports also say that you need to plan for eventual upgrades to be compliant with guidelines and regulations. So that's, so that's, these are all things to be, to be aware of. So the bottom line is on the north spillway structure, there's work to be done. When you come to the north embankment, well, it's 100 years old. It was put there by your forefathers. And guess what? <laughs> it also requires detailed engineering and inspection and stability analysis. There are no reports that, that I'm aware of where you have a, an engineer on behalf of the township saying, yes, that embankment uh, meets all of the appropriate standards and, and so on and so on. So that's, it, it's a big question mark over that as well. And it's 100 years old, so it, it, it needs, it, it needs some, some looking at to, to give you the assurances of, you know, what are the risks? The risks may be low, the risks may be high, I can't speak to that, but the reports are telling you that engineering is required, you know, for that, uh, for that part of your asset. When we look at the uh, South Spillway structure itself, 100 years old, it, it's had numerous modifications to it over that 100 years. Uh, absolutely, the, the, it requires replacement or restoration. It's, it's, those are your, that's, that's what you have to do and, and the committee is, is looking at you know, various options and scenarios to, to evaluate. So that's a, things have to change there for sure. When we look at the, uh, some of the old construction drawings, you can see that at the very top of the piers in the south spillway structure, wow, they, they were originally quite narrow. But look at the base, look, look what's down at the very bottom. I mean, it's just, it's just a massive, massive structure. We know from the engineering reports that the concrete is poor, poor quality, but it's being held in place by, all, by everything that's around it, and, and we can all say that it hasn't flowed down the river yet, but it's, 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 uh, it, it's done its job for the, last for the last 100 years. The other thing that we know within the yellow lines uh, over the years, people have scabbed all kinds of additional concrete onto the sides of the piers to support them. Well, I mean, that's all part of building the structure, but they haven't done anything down in the bottom. But, you know, still at the bottom, you've got a massive, you know, a massive big structure there. When we look at the spillway, uh, again, you know, these, these are the original drawings from the uh, 1920s. And, and you can see the spillway, and, and when they built it, they built it right down on the glacial till. Um, so it was, uh, I mean, it was constructed well for the time for the day. But what's happened since is where I have the yellow box, you know, mod, the piers have been modified with extra concrete. And on the downstream side, they, uh, oh, in the 1950s, they installed a sheet pile cutoff wall. So these are improvements that were made at various times but they still do not leave you with a stable structure today in engineering terms according to, according to the current engineering standards. So now, that, so that's just, is, there's the narrative from the reports telling you what you have. Now I'd like to take you on a walk through what the reports say about discharge capacity. In the KGS report, they give you a, a here's the, they, they did all the calculations and the uh, and and here's here's what they showed and and the and so I'm going to take you now into what what this says but this dot this this chart and all of the documents are in the reports for you to review. Going back to the 1920s when the original uh, spillway was built, it had a maximum discharge capacity of 300 cubic meters per second. And, and the, uh, 100 years ago, your forefathers did not have access to the technologies that we have today. They didn't have the water records or all this information, but, but you know, they were pretty astute people. They had a lot of experience and they did, they did what they thought they could do. Well, what they learned very quickly was 
that the river floods at a rate which exceeds the spillway capacity of that original structure. So you can see here the, the one in 25 year flood, 300 cubic meters per second, that equals the discharge capacity. And if you get a one in 50 year flood or one in 100 year flood like you've had in recent years, well, guess what? Your, the river is going over the top of the dam. So they came to realize that in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and that's what one of the contributing factors that led to them building the North Spillway structure, because they said, wow, we need more spillway capacity to handle the river. And, and you can see, so, so again, these numbers are all derived from the, from the KGS report. So, so the, now, if we look at the current situation that you have, right now, according to KGS's report, you have 300 cubic meters per second in the uh, old spillway, south spillway. You've got 200 cubic meters discharge capacity in the, in, the, uh, in the north side. And through pretty much all of our lifetimes, all of you have seen the river do its thing with this much capacity available to you to handle the flow. So you have all the personal experience of, of what goes on here with this system given to us or given to you in the in the 1960s and and when you look at so 500 cubic meters capacity you know what you say is wow that, that's pretty decent that 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 allows us to handle a one in 25 year flood it allows us to handle a one in a hundred year flood if we get a one in a thousand year flood yikes I mean that that exceeds the numbers so the uh, what uh, what I believe is relevant here is when you think about these numbers 300 cubic meters per second is what the forefathers had. 500 cubic meters per second is what you have right now. The question is, as you look forward and you think about the kind of weather we've been having recently in climate change, you need to pick a new number. And you'll pick that number where your, where your comfort level and your, and your budget and your assessment for risk takes you. KGS have indicated in their reports their recommended inflow design flood is 415 cubic meters per second, which is about 80% of the capacity that you, that you have right now. But again, this is, these are the numbers that, that people need to be, to, be, uh, to be comfortable with. I'd like to take you now on a little bit of a step forward. And, and if we have a look at uh, what should happen, you, you get a big flood coming. And suddenly, one of your peers lets go on the South Spillway structure. It's not going to happen on the winter's day. It's probably going to happen when you have a peak flood. Away goes one of your peers. Down comes a, down comes a couple of your bridge sections. Your discharge capacity has just reduced to 200 cubic meters per second. And now you're down to 400 cubic meters per second. And you've got a river that wants to give you uh, you know whatever that number is. So this is this. These are the kind of risks you know that you have when you look at flow capacity. If we and 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 heaven forbid, if you lose two piers and three bridge sections, now you're down to 150 cubic meters per second, 350 cubic meters per second. Now, now the river is giving you a lot more than that, and heaven forbid if you lose all three piers and you lose the whole bridge during a big flood event you are right back to where your forefathers were in the 1920s. You've got 300 cubic meters per second. That's all that your structure can, can handle. I mean, you're going to have water everywhere. So these are the risk factors that, that, that need to be weighed it, when, you, when you look at things that you're going to do with, with a structure like this. The point I'd like Sorry, to make... Can, can I ask a bit more yes. detail? I don't understand how losing the section of the dam decreases capacity. So, I don't understand how losing sections of the dam decreases ah, okay. capacity. So, so have you it, not washed the dam out at so, that point? So, so if, for example, uh, you had a, a pier would, would fail and the dam would come down, then all of that concrete debris would sit on top of the spillway or just downstream. So, so that would uh, pose a barrier to the spillway and it would restrict the flow that, that would be coming across. So I, I did not. I did not reduce those numbers to zero, but just as an indication, it, it, it will not have the same, you'll not be able to get the same amount of water uh, over the spillway if you have any kind of a collapse that takes place. 
just because you'll have obstructions in the water. Okay. Okay. The the so the point I'd like to make is that dam stability risk in engineering capacity is directly proportional to your discharge capacity. When your discharge capacity is low or when it's impaired in any reason, then your dam stability risk is, is elevated. On the other hand, when your dam discharge capacity is high, then your dam stability risk decreases. Today, as we sit in this room, you have lots of capacity available to you. The risk of anything happening today is low. But when you have a flood event, now you need all of your capacity to offset, to offset the risk. So the corollary becomes to reduce dam stability risk, increase your discharge capacity. And the question I pose is, what is the lowest cost option to reduce dam stability risk, increase discharge capacity? So that, that, that is the, you know, that basically is your insurance policy to offset, to offset the risk of something happening during a flood event. One suggestion, one way of doing that would be to increase the capacity of your north spillway. In this cartoon, and that's all it is, by replacing the embankment section with an expanded north spillway, I mean, you're up to 700 cubic meters per second because now you've got 300 cubic meters per second through the existing south structure. You've got 200 through the north structure, 200 through an expanded structure. Once, so now with this concept, you've increased your discharge capacity. Therefore, you've lowered the risk on the existing structure as it sits right now. Yes? Yeah, Mr. Chair? Uh, is this assuming there's no stop logs in any of those? Correct. Absolutely, absolutely correct. So this, so all of these numbers derived from KGS report are based on no stop logs. So this would be predicated on us having enough for notice to take out the stop logs or them not being there. Correct. And 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 the thing is, with a concept like this where you're putting extra capacity in, even if you were in a situation such as happened a couple of years ago, where things happen so quickly that the crew can't get there to do it. If you have excess capacity available to you, then you've reduced the risk of, of something of something major happening. But, but all of these numbers from KGS report are based on no stop logs. The and then you can see that even should you should a, a, a catastrophe happen on the south spillway structure, you're still at your 500 cubic meters per second capacity that you have right now. So uh, I'm just trying to correlate for you design capacity versus risk so that as you consider these factors, you're able to, to uh, support your, your, your decisions. But, in, but, but the uh, discharge capacity, I think, is a very important uh, consideration in, in terms of what you do. Um, now, as I'd like to present these numbers. Um, for you, the uh, in the uh, BM Ross and KGS uh, uh, work, one of the concepts that KGS provided to you was the cost of a new concrete overflow weir, and and when in, that was they did this in in 2018, and their their uh, ACCE class four number was six point some million. Well, that was in 2018, so allowing for a bit of inflation, my ballpark number here is you're probably up to eight million dollars if you were to consider a new <laughs> replacement concrete spillway. Likewise, KGS gave you uh, uh, a, a capital cost estimate for an earth embankment and new spillway structure. Their number in 2018 was four point seven million. And again, I'm just suggesting with inflation, you should be thinking about, about five million dollars. The So those numbers are in the reports. To construct a new central spillway where your embankment is right now, my guess, and that's all I'm doing is guessing, you could probably do that, just that portion alone, and provide yourself with more, more capacity for about $2 million, or about a quarter of the cost of a new concrete overflow spillway. 
a new central spillway structure would give you capacity, it would lower your risk of, of catastrophe during, during a flood event. We spoke during a, my previous meeting about uh, restoration of the, and I'll present some concepts here in terms of restoration of the south spillway structure, both without a bridge and with a bridge. And these are my numbers that, that I think are sort of in the, in the range that you should be looking at relative to new cost. And, and what I would see is that before any work would be done in the south spillway structure, I would encourage you to seriously consider going for additional discharge capacity first to lower your risk, to give you the time to, um, to, uh, to do restoration work on the, on the south spillway. The, anything that you do, any decisions that you make, the, uh, either a new concrete overflow weir, a new earth embankment, uh, a central spillway structure, or a complete decommissioning of the dam, any of those, that's, that's money that's on the critical path. These are things that uh, the outcome from the committee and, and the future decisions of council and so on, that's, that, this, is, this is money that needs to be committed in the short term to reduce your risk and to do things. By spending the money on this central spillway capacity, uh, on the central spillway structure, and increasing your capacity, this now gives you time to do the restoration work. The restoration work now goes, becomes off the critical path. Because now it's, you're, you, you have the opportunity to restore something without it being a, a, a risk to you of something catastrophic happening during a flood event because you've put, you've put in place the, the uh, discharge capacity. Let me now take you on to uh, just some concepts here. Um, the, uh, if you were to restore the south spillway structure without a bridge, first thing you'd do is you'd come along, down would come the bridge and down would come the piers. Next thing I would suggest would be the, the downstream tow of the existing spillway should also be demolished because the concrete is of poor quality and it's not very thick concrete. Then what you would do is, or what you could do is, a massive new concrete block upstream, large concrete block downstream because you need the heavy weight to uh, make the dam stable. A new uh, sill cap uh, across the top could be done and then and KGS talks about having anchors in the ground. So all of this additional concrete weight plus anchors in the ground, they make the structure stable. And, and that's, so that would be, I believe, a less costly option than building a totally new structure because you're not excavating a lot of the existing structure that's already in place. You're just burying it and encapsulating it. And notice on the drawing, you're not exceeding the existing uh, spillway elevation. That's, that's, that's being maintained. Um, yet uh, at uh, 309 point, uh, point 28. The, um, if we look now at uh, another option, which would be restoring the South Spillway structure, but now with a bridge, because uh, uh, you know, the gentleman from Alliance Club, you mentioned in your concept about being able to walk uh, across the bridge and so on. So if, if that was desired, then here's a way of doing that. Uh, installing temporary load-bearing truss uh, underneath the underneath the uh, bridge structure, and supporting your truss by temporary cribs upstream and downstream, and then installing permanent load-bearing concrete beams to support the bridge, and that that would be uh, you know these these elements up here. So just just basically you're building a new support floor of concrete beneath the existing bridge. So I'm, I'm not talking about trying to restore the rotten concrete. I'm just talking about putting a new floor underneath the, uh, underneath the uh, existing floor to fill the gaps that are there. And then once that's been done, then you can come over, you can remove the old pier that can be uh, demolished. You can construct a new pier that would be giving you permanent support of the, of the, of the bridge supports. And then once you have all of your peers eventually uh, looked after, then now you can come in. So there's, there's your bridge structure is, is now being supported on new peers. 
Now you can come at your, uh, your uh, uh, spillway structure and proceed as, as indicated before by, uh, by putting the, the large concrete blocks in to, to make it stable. So these are, these are just concepts, but I'm just trying to provide you with some, some guidance in terms of how, this, this, how these, these things could be undertaken. So there you go, that's the end of my presentation for this evening. Are there any further questions? So, um, in order to increase overflow capacity, in theory, do you think you could account for the capacity that would result from installing power generation as additional capacity? Yes, 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 yes. And, and this would give you, a, a, again, an excellent opportunity in, 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 expand, in, in, in doing so, of providing whatever uh, uh, pen stocks, whatever... Uh, you know whatever whatever you might need to facilitate that that this would be an excellent opportunity of, of doing so okay. Mr. Chairman uh, Peter the bridge you're proposing would be able to support what kind of loading um, it, it's if I could just please uh, let me just back vehicular up or the this would be um, uh, just in this cartoon, I, I chose to show the entire bridge as is mm -hmm. being supported. Mm -hmm. But for example, if the decisions were just to have a walkway uh, going across, then for example, the, the, the upstream left third, that could be supported and the downstream two thirds could be demolished or half and half or you know, wh whatever is appropriate. So you have many sub options that, that could be considered. And, and, and again, your, your question is, is very relevant. Uh, and it, it comes back to the, the desires of the community. And mm -hmm. if, if, it, if it's only for bicycles and, 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 uh, and people and, and, and dogs and so on, then that could, that's all the money that would be spent and that's all the work that would be done. I think the Reeve wants it to support horses and buggies, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, so so that the new design that you're proposing, the weight of the bridge would no longer be required to 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 uh, to strengthen the dam and hold it in place. Exactly, because the in in uh, in the in the KGS and BM Ross reports, what they what they speak about is they speak about the the installation of more concrete that I'm proposing here, both downstream and upstream, so the the footprint of the dam becomes longer. And, and then, but they also speak about the anchoring. They speak about right. anchors going down about 15 meters into the glacial till. So the combination of extra weight and anchors is, is what gives you the required strength to make the dam very stable. And, and the thing is, even though uh, I, I think our, our, the, the assessment would be that the existing concrete structure is insufficiently strong. That would be based on the information we have to be supported by anchors. So really you would need the new concrete blocks upstream and downstream. You those you need something new, concrete and strong with anchors to give the required support for stability. Thank uh, you. I have a question for you, Peter. Uh, from those uh, uh, estimates that you're giving in the different scenarios, uh, you had the two million to put in the spillway in where the earthen, earthen uh, dam is now at uh, two million. And that doesn't address the, the current situation or the current problem that we have with the south. That just gives us time to... Precisely. So there would still be... The problem we have would still be there. Absolutely. Without having... Absolutely. Right. So that would ascertain spending the money to repair or replace the south structure at what time? At a time of your choice. Because the, the, the initial expenditure of the central spillway would provide you the flow capacity to reduce the risk mm -hmm. of, um, of something catastrophic happening to the south structure. And then going forward, the restoration of the south structure could be done over whatever timetable is, is appropriate. 
and and based on uh, based on funding fundraising things of that nature because to, to clarify the, to, to map out what you put together to restore the south structure you're gonna have to block a, a good section or all of that structure while you form and pour the concrete right correct so correct. your your capacity search capacity is going to be impaired during construction exactly and and that and that is that is it that's exactly what drew me to the concept of the central spillway structure so that be, because what whatever whatever you attempt for restoration and whenever you attempt it for that period of time your discharge capacity will be impaired absolutely mm -hmm. so how can that discharge capacity be provided while you're doing the repair uh, i should have finished the, the question I had about with the, uh, the, the the spillway, all those numbers were without stop locks. Correct. All, all of the so, all, all of the numbers I derived from the KGS report were all without stop locks. Until the south structure structure is uh, rehabilitated or replaced, there would be no stop logs in there, and the pond would not be at an optimum level. Um, the the uh, everything that I was speaking about was. Essentially, your to to have stop logs in the in the north structure and to operate the pond at at your normal levels as you have been, that I believe is within the I, I believe that is doable from an engineering standpoint. It's the the issue of risk comes when you have these flood events coming through. That's that's the you know that's when you, that's when you're really at risk because now you have all of this energy. Hitting the hitting the cell structure, with the cell structure not having any even pedestrian traffic and being in such bad shape, yeah. leaving it for another twenty years while we have a spillway put in there, uh, still isn't going to address the problem of the cell structure. I, I just don't understand the. I see that I see where the the capacity of the yeah. of uh, uh, the water flow over it is increased with putting in yes. the spillway in there. Yes. Um, I'm just it, it just it just appears to me that it, eventually what you, the numbers you're going to look at are still going to be the six to eight million. Absolutely. Fix both uh, over oh, to to get a complete structure all the way across up to a high standard. You're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. And the the with this concept, it's what I'm trying to indicate. There's a possibility to spend an amount of money initially. And then the balance of the money could be spent over a period of time. Whereas the the first option, the new concrete overflow, the earth embankment uh, concept, the central spillway, that's all essentially immediate money that needs to be spent in one shot as soon as you can complete the approvals and permitting and, and so on. Everything to do with the restoration, that that can happen over whatever time period is, is chosen. Okay. Um, your restoration cartoon, you called it, um, is not going to have the same kind of length of life as a if we tear it down and put something new in. I would yes, yes, because if you go if you go with something like this, once again yes, you're you're looking at an engineering life of fifty years plus. Because, oh, because so all of your, I won't have to be on another one of these councils. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely correct. <laughs> absolutely correct. Uh, I'm sorry, there's no, there'll there'll be no questions the, from the, yeah, the, the <laughs> More questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Good, thank you. No question. No, sir, that's not the correct. Reasoning for the no questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, Six point uh, oh, uh, correspondence. Does anyone have uh, correspondence uh, to present to the uh, council? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Six point one is just a reminder to uh, uh, committee members that the letters that were received uh, from the, the stakeholders were uh, presented to you, and uh, the ability to read them at. Uh, uh, off the website or off the, uh, the package that you were sent. Uh, Seven point uh, one. Other business. Does anyone have any other business that they wish to bring to towards the uh, meeting? <coughs> Seeing none. Seven point one. 
have a, a vacant seat on the committee, as you can see. Uh, the uh, resolution was sent to the council, and uh, council has uh, rendered their uh, uh, their decision on the uh, uh, CL 2020-01 House and Dam and Bridge Committee uh, seat vacancy. The Council of the Township of North Huron hereby received a report from the clerk dated on January the 13th, 2020, regarding the potential of the, uh, potential House and Dam and Bridge Committee uh, seat va uh, vacancy for information purposes. And further, the Council authorized the leave of absence for the House and Dam and Bridge Committee for member uh, Mike Martin until uh, March 29th. At such time as he's, he's planning on coming back. So they were basically given that time. And that motion was carried. Uh, 7.2, uh, we have a power generation video. I believe this was the, uh, the, the presentation that the uh, Reeve was trying to send through. I'm just wondering about to what you have here with the sleuth and that, if you could explain it in the generator, this part of it right here. Well, uh, this was an old mill. Uh, it was used for uh, grinding grain. Uh, I uh, converted it uh, into a, a hydro uh, producing uh, uh, plant. Uh, being we had the generator and everything right here, the uh, infrastructure was here to uh, do it at a relatively uh, cheap dollar. It uh, cost me $250,000 to uh, uh, get up and running producing power, but uh, within the first five years, uh, it paid itself back, and we've been running for 18 years, uh, so uh, the, the, the dividends have been uh, uh, pretty spectacular. This is actually my uh, retirement project. Um, the uh, other benefits uh, are to the community. Uh, um, the initial uh, intention was to uh, uh, tear the, the dam um, and uh, put the river back to its original uh, uh, levels, which would have created a stream about 50 feet across. and. Uh, now we've basically got a lake here. Um, um, if you'd been here uh, an hour ago, uh, there was a canoeist and uh, two people uh, out here fishing. On an average day, there's a dozen uh, uh, boats uh, uh, coming and going out here uh, uh, fishing. Uh, and, uh, and we even have water skiers uh, and uh, uh, Saturday we had two great big uh, uh, white swans and a, a yellow uh, uh, duck uh, uh, kids uh, out on the water uh, uh, in these rubber dinghies uh, uh, floating around. Uh, plus uh, we had 170 guests uh, out here for a wedding and uh, the the water, uh, the pond was uh, their background, uh, and uh, we're uh, attracting, on average, I would say we attract 10,000 people to the uh, community of Chesley uh, um, every year uh, uh, because of uh, you know the, the park that we've created. Uh, we uh, are doing weddings. Uh, every weekend and uh, then functions during the week and it's been a, a great uh, uh, boom to the community. For the generator, if you don't mind me asking, the upkeep for the generator, costing for, for your generator, is it a lot uh, per year? 18 years ago I put it in. Uh, since then I've replaced uh, one set of belts uh, at a cost of $3,500 and one fuse at a cost of $120. And uh, uh, four times a year I grease it, so I've maybe spent uh, $20 on grease. And that's, uh, that's it. That's simply amazing. And it's just down here, this tiny little bit of water. It doesn't take like a, a waterfall or anything to run this. This is a gentle stream well, going through. Uh, we, we, have 14, we have 14 feet of head which means the height of the water above the uh, turbine. And uh, so uh, that generates approximately 90 kilowatts of power 
per hour. Now, right now, our water is uh, uh, down. We haven't had, uh, we've had a half an inch of, of rain in the last seven weeks. So our water uh, 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 is down. I turned the, the water back um, at night so that I can produce uh, during the, the daytime. And I try and keep the uh, mill pond uh, at uh, a fairly constant level so that, uh, well, as you can see across there, the, you know, the neighbors all had boats and uh, it's, it's used, you know, it's a pretty important recreation source for the community. Certainly the, the sun's getting me right in the yeah. eyes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Bailey, for that, uh, that uh, video. On to uh, 7.3, 7 the uh, general work plan review. Uh, does this uh, do have any uh, input as to uh, uh, the advancement of this uh, work plan? Uh, I think we've pretty, pretty much exhausted up to now the information gathering portions of uh, our meetings, and uh, I think we're into the at least uh, section five of the detailed analysis, and uh, with the risk and the alternatives to. Uh, the top alternatives, uh, preparing a task list for implementation, uh, assessing the risk. We heard from that tonight. Um, I really, well, I'm just going to the, uh, well, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll work itself out here in a minute. We're going to 8.1. Any reports from the, uh, that we haven't heard from uh, that the community members would like to bring forward? Seeing none. The uh, roundtable discussion. Uh, we made some headway the last uh, meeting we had at, uh, at uh, having some conversation across the table on uh, on uh, what we uh, what we could do. We had re uh, agreed to uh, remove the do nothing off the list. Uh, it's it's time to do some heavy lifting now and do uh, and do some hard decision making uh, amongst the uh, the committee here. Uh, these are the portions now where we can. Uh, start uh, making motions and seeing if we have any uh, uh, cohesive uh, ideas as to going forward and to uh, finalize uh, uh, our way forward. So uh, I'll open the round table discussion to anybody at the table that would like to uh, bring forth any of their, uh, their ideas as to going forward. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may, okay. um, we received quite a bit of information at this meeting, and I personally would like a bit of time to digest it a, a bit, and uh, I'm certainly not prepared to take any major steps today. I'd like to think a little bit about, uh, have some time to think about where to go from here. Uh, the only other thing I had from previous meetings, I'm not sure how important it is, but uh, we, I did have a note from the last meeting that uh, any responses that uh, the township received regarding the strategic plan were going to be available for us if, if in fact, they've been presented to council yet? I didn't they have know. not been presented to council oh, yet. Okay. That'll be uh, tomorrow, actually. Tomorrow oh. at uh, 2 o'clock. Or at noon. Mm -hmm. 2, so 2 o'clock. This is when council will have the, uh, have the results from the, uh, uh, the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And we'll be uh, going forward with that uh, tomorrow. So I have nothing to, to bring to this uh, committee as far as the, uh, the uh, strategic plan input from I haven't seen it yet. Is that meeting open? Apparently. Us? We already got an email inviting us. Oh, oh okay. Two o'clock tomorrow. Yeah. And if you'd like, you come Friday for the budget meeting for the budget. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, um, I have another question, um, and and perhaps this would have to go to council for clarification. So um, I don't recall. I apologize whether it was from the terms of reference or whether it was from you know direction received at our first meeting, but um, I recall that the intent of council is that um, whatever option um, selected by this committee is um, will be dealt with through fundraising initiatives and that there's no intent 
for cost to hit the you know basically the operating budget or the regular budget of the town um, so thinking about the possible options a bit further um, I wonder if that actually applies to the remove option um, my thought process there is I don't believe you're going to get a lot of excited people interested in fundraising for the remove option and the remove option in essence I think would be undertaken by the town in order to remove the risk and liability which would be created from the do nothing option right so um, and of course the reason why I think this um, matters pays it, it is is, uh, is worth noting is in my mind if the town does understand that they have um, a liability to remove remove the dam if that is if, if that is the the need and there's a certain price tag associated with that then I would assume then council would be willing to spend that money whether it's to remove the dam or to refurbish or replace the dam so as a result it changes then possibly the possibility of, of the cost incurred for fundraising for replacing or repairing the dam so I, I think it's an important maybe question that should be taken to council uh, is if they how, how they feel the dollars would be you know basically raised uh, and if the remove option is is selected and whether they would and, and if they do say okay yeah that would have to come out of town coffers that they'd be willing to redirect that to support the removal or the refurbish or replace option the uh, well, council hasn't made any any determination as far as the, the other than that for this process would be no tax dollars uh, be allocated for uh, uh, any of the options uh, before council uh, for, for the main reason they didn't know what the options were going to be um, if you're going to replace if the option is to replace the, uh, the dam removal is 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 part of that you can't you can't build a new one unless you've, you've torn down the old one uh, from the shape and the, the consensus from the uh, engineering reports that the bridge would have to be replaced or removed in order to repair the dam so it, 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 that option would already be in the replace or repair uh, so the option isn't just take the bridge off the top and leave it that, that, that doesn't do anything for the structure actually actually it worsens it if you remove the bridge off the top without any plans of what you're going to do underneath it weakens the underneath and you're creating a, a larger problem so I'm not sure to totally understand it, but you, you, you're, you're asking, is council going to remove the bridge anyway? So, so my, my question is, my, my understanding is that the intent of council is to enact the recommendation of this committee. Mm -hmm. If the committee recommends remove, mm -hmm. where does council think that money's going to come from? Um, because I doubt it's going to come from fundraising activities. I doubt the public is going to be interested in fundraising for that. So, so if we if, if council agrees with that mindset that yes you know what if if the committee recommends remove and and we're going to have to pay for that out of out of town operating dollars right then um, then so so just to throw rough dollars out there if it's going to cost the town a half million dollars to remove the dam <coughs> that's that's a that's a, a set expenditure that's going to have to happen here. And so my question is, would they then be willing to redirect uh, a half million dollars to um, refurbishing the dam, which of course then removes the need to remove it? And 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 I think it's an important distinction, and, and would affect certainly my thought process of of the selected option. The council has directed that there be no tax dollars into this process of, of finding out what what to do. Once you've made up your mind of what to do, then council would have the ability to say to set a plan as as we would work a, a work plan out to, then ascertain that there's government funding to do the procedures or do the do the implement the, the things that we're going to do. Uh, if there's no uh, uh, funds available, uh, I don't see council. Well, I can't speak for them. Uh, they haven't made their decision yet, uh, but. 
just by the direction of, of the rules that was put out for this committee, that uh, the there wouldn't be any tax dollars. You would have to put that out to, to the entire municipality, not just the ward of Wingham. And it would be a tough sell to someone out in the farm to have to pay their, raise their taxes to, to implement something that wasn't going to be of any benefit to them in their tax base. So uh, I, I can only go by the uh, the uh, the outline that we were given for this for this committee that uh, is sitting there. We know tax dollars uh, initiated for this this process. Okay, so, but my question remains: How would council then tend to pay for the removal of the dam? <coughs> have to find out that's that's the that's the golden egg uh, so are you saying that if if the if this consensus of this committee was to repair the dam the fundraising portion that's been uh, touted this the entire length of this committee uh, committee would not include the bridge no what I'm, what I'm saying is I, I I understand the community could get behind and support Raising the funds for refurbishing and replacing the dam because it provides an asset that's for the, the public good. I don't see members of the community getting excited about raising money for the removal of the dam. Right. So 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 I understand that if if I choose to recommend refurbishment or re replacement, that I need to be satisfied that the public at large would be interested in supporting that. What I'm asking for is. What, where's the mechanism of raising funds if the remove option is selected? Well, that would be before council and not before this committee. Those options would have to be viewed by, by council and, 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 the, and the taxpayer. Mr. Right Chair, I, I think we can make that argument when we, when we come to a recommendation on that. I think you've got a good point that, that uh, whether the money spent to take it out or to um, for the first half million towards refurbishing it, shouldn't make a difference well, to we, council. We have representatives from all sides here, so uh, you can ask that of your your, your fellow uh, table mates here of what the stance is on their each other's uh, concept of whether the fundraising portion is not or is or isn't. Uh, there is, there's no money uh, in our, uh, no money allocated in our uh, curriculum in order to make this decision. <coughs> the decision is to find out what, what everyone wants to do and then there may be fundraising, another committee for fundraising and there might be another committee for uh, going forward. And it's just trying to get a consensus and everyone to see all of the, as I said, stated at the opening, everyone to see all the reports at the same time rather than just going off of one from that year and, and trying to put them all together so we can make a, a consensus of what's the best way of going forward, whether it is replace, uh, repair, uh, or, or, or I mean, you, uh, it's simple as just making a motion and having a majority pass it as to as to what what way you want to go, and then after we've we've come to a conclusion, uh, then we can uh, as the, uh, Rob was saying, as we can address how we're going to do go about doing it financially. The financial the, the was not a a, uh, a a curriculum that we were given to to decide upon. Right from the start, that we would, that we, this committee was not going to uh, have to decide on where that that came from. Uh, I know the earlier uh, portions you, that you brought up that you couldn't make that decision without knowing the cost. Well, now we have some basis on cost for you to make that that decision. But uh, I can't uh, speak as what uh, the council will do once that decision is made. That'll be this decision is just finally made up to council as to whether they accept or deny even this, this committee's recommendations. Mr. Chairman, I certainly see Mitch's point and I understand it completely. Um, based on what the chairman has said, I doubt we're gonna get a, we'd get an answer from council even if you asked them. Well, you're not gonna get point. it from me. No, I know. Oh, but I, Mr. Chair, I think we can make some <coughs> assumptions around that, that 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 money that would be spent to demolish it would be also applied to refurbishing. Could be. I think I think our recommendations are going to be conditional on certain assumptions, and I yeah. think we have to state what those assumptions are, and that would be one that we would state. 
that we're assuming it's cash neutral, right? Whether you demolish it or put a half a million towards towards refurbishing it for the town. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then let them figure out where the money comes from. Yeah, if that's all the uh, options and opinions we'd like to put forward at the, uh, the roundtable discussions. Uh, 9.1, uh, review of options. Uh, discussions uh, surrounding the remaining identity, identified options, re rehabilitate, remove, and replace, uh, other than the funding. Uh, how did uh, this uh, committee receive the information that we've had uh, so far? I was, uh, I want to, I want to commend, uh, commend uh, Mr. White, uh, at least on my perspective of it, of never really being able to get my head around bringing all the reports together in, in, a, in a, something that I could see is actually when he diagrammed it out there, what, how reconstruction or rehabilitation would be, uh, would be <coughs> attained. Uh, I, I was grateful for that report. That helped me immensely. So, Mr. Chair, just thinking out loud, the, the, couple, the couple revelations I had today, I guess, were, um, were, t were twofold. First of all, the, the risk that needs to be mitigated during any, any restoration or replacement activities, right? So I think that was, that was a great point that was raised today um, in that obviously the, the, the structure of the dam has to be kept safe um, while you do any restoration or repair activities. Um, so, so in my mind, it, it almost, there's now, there's now two reasons to install um, hydro generation. Right. First is a, is a mitigating secondary spillway during any restoration or, or replacement activities of the, of the south structure and then also then as revenue generation going forward. So that, that was a, something that I think was new that was brought forward today and I think it's, it's an interesting point. I, you know, I didn't see as far as the report going any avenue going forward as to where to gain the money back in from installing but the government isn't buying back energy and I haven't heard of anyone in town wanting to buy it so they, they can't buy it but if the if the town owned and operates the power generation right then we can basically use it and 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 then not have to buy power from from Ontario Hydro and that actually was was a, a, a interesting thought and I don't know if, if we could get that number I'm curious what the town pays per kilowatt hour for hydro if we could get that information, if, if Sean could provide that information to us. Yeah, Mr. remember Chair. that that's going to add another couple of percentages to the, to the millions to construct that, add that on to the re rehabilitation of just the dam. If you're adding, adding hydroelectric, you're going to have to add the costs. Right, but as, 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 Mr., uh, as Mr. White pointed out, you either need to spend the money on a permanent spillway that doesn't get you any money in the future, or in my mind, you can spend it on a spillway that has revenue generation attached to it, right? So I would think I would think the revenue generation stream would be the, the better stream. I just don't know where you're going to get it. What's that? I just don't know where you're going to get so, it. So so that would be the the option that he went through, right? Was net meter was net meter. Where, where basically it'd be like having a solar panel on your house. You use your own power first, and that just reduces the amount of power you buy so there from Ontario Hydro. There have been a lot of solar projects going ahead lately since the government stopped buying back the power. So you power. don't need government approval for net metering, right? If you're using a 500 kilowatts per mm -hmm. hour and you're generating 200 kilowatts per hour, then you just only need to buy 300 from from the, the from Ontario Hydro, so that's the net metering Go ahead, concept. Just, yeah. Mr. Chair, I think your assumption is that you can generate hydro for less than you can buy it, and that's not a given assumption. Last cast years ago, I was involved in looking at cogeneration for for Wingham. We used 15, 20 megawatts in town at the time, putting in a natural gas cogeneration where you generate stuff. And we couldn't produce it for less than we could buy it for hydro. Whenever we went to them with that option, 
or we got better pricing from them. So it, it, it just never bottomed out. I, I think yeah. that's an assumption you're making that you can generate it for less than you buy it. It, it is an assumption, but um, natural gas cogeneration is actually one of the pricier ways to generate power. With hydroelectric, Basically, the 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 costs of hydroelectric come from your upfront capital costs, right? Yes. The 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 operating costs are very exactly. low. So my point is, is if we have to build capital dollars to put, to, so so what 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 Mr. White said is, if we're going to rehabil rehab rehabilitate or repair the dam, first thing we have to do is install extra spillway capacity. To compensate for the fact you're going to lose spillway capacity when you do your refurbishment and restoration, right? So, so his suggestion was to build another replica of the north section, right? So in my mind, you're spending two million dollars to in include just to generate additional spillway capacity, and that's it. In my mind, you could probably spend about the same amount of capital dollars to increase both spillway capacity and design it for. To house a turbine, right? If it's if it's cash neutral, there'd be a payback. Who? Yeah. He's saying, I heard six hundred thousand dollars for two hundred kilowatt additional expense. Mm -hmm. So, but you wouldn't do necessarily. Let Let's say you're putting two spillways in the earth embankment. You wouldn't necessarily put two in there and then put your hydro capacity over on the south side. You might put one in here and get the other capacity over here. Well, I, I would assume since you want to run most of your river's capacity through the generation, yep. that you would be able, that would be the, all the by, all the extra bypass capacity or discharge capacity you would have to add. Possibly. To mitigate for the construction activities. Mm -hmm. But again, that's an assumption. Mm -hmm. Still doesn't repair the bridge or the south structure or rejuvenate or no but the in, the indication was we'd have to build it if we're going to do refurbish or replace we have to do we have to build additional spillway capacity first first mm -hmm. yeah if, if you can add it on for a lesser price i, I think mm -hmm. you should look at it that just it just increases the Capital investment. Well, the capital investment by by uh, donations at this point. Uh, whether what 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 you know, like as you're saying, what's what's the cutoff level as far as uh, uh, the capacity of the municipality or the towns people to raise the funds to do that? I mean, the higher we get, the harder it will be. Um, we just we just added an, another portion. Another well, not not necessarily, Mr. Chairman. We'd add. We wouldn't be adding additional money till we actually put in the hydro generation equipment. If we pour the concrete to provide the capacity for the flow mm -hmm. that we have to do anyway, then we make that capacity such that then we can put a generating station into it if it pr if it mm -hmm. seems like it's going to be feasible to do that. Well, he he said you have to build a 13 by 52 foot footing right mm -hmm. for the pipe if you're doing that anyways you m there might be a savings yeah that's what i noticed maybe no no, no additional cost no additional cost mm -hmm. for the concrete portion so i have to run a pipe to lower that from the head height <laughs> to get the maximum <laughs> well that uh that seems to be a, an excellent idea to uh, move forward on uh, you know, as you were sitting you wanted uh, some extra time to look at the information that was provided to us uh, this evening this afternoon uh, I, I suggest that next meeting uh, we come back with uh, uh, pros and cons of our of our uh, our own thoughts on, on how mm -hmm. to come forward and we uh, start charting them down and trying to uh, uh, just because our, our time is, is, is drawing so close to June <laughs> for a full year of this committee that uh, we, we have to come to, to have some time to be able to do a, a work plan and uh, in a uh, final report uh, for uh, July that uh, we uh, start making and narrowing down some of these uh, some of the uh, 
decision making uh, that we have to do the heavy lifting. Uh, go ahead, John. Here you go. Mr. Chair, would it uh, would it help the committee if these pros and cons that you've indicated were perhaps returned to me to be incorporated into the next agenda? Then, then we can move yes. in advance time right, to look yeah. at everybody's thoughts and comments. Yeah, so if we don't put it on the agenda now, we, for next to we won't be able to discuss it. So yes, that would be. Uh, if so that was, if that was the desire of the committee, I would need all of those pros and cons on each of the three uh, options from each committee member by say the 12th of February, the latest, so we can compile it and post. So we're going to meet on the 19th then. I think it's the 19th. That's the third Wednesday. Yep. Uh, you had a question, Rob? I was going to ask if, if it would be possible to get clarification on that Chesley power generation, what the, what the government buyback is on the hydro for that. Um, is that possible to find out? I don't doubt that. <coughs> Build it, you know. Why well, he didn't mention the, how much they were selling it back to the grid for, and I that would be. I think you need to know that. I, I bet it is too, but I think we should know that. It. I mean, it should be in essence public information, right? Because it's a contract between to the to the Ontario government. Well, we're not burning to find out. Yeah, I, I just I think we need to know the whole picture of that. If, if those if those opportunities don't exist now, then I think we have to be clear on the difference. Well, they, they certainly it's not don't, apples to they apples. certainly don't in, it, at that degree. No, no, no. no I've got a neighbor selling it at 80 cents a kilowatt. So. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. And, and Mr. Chair, sorry, if at, at the same time, I know it was discussed before, if we could, if we could find out what, what rate the town of North Huron pays. Um, maybe we can find that out. Maybe, maybe off peak and peak difference. But mm, I don't know if the large large consumers of power normally don't pay peak and off peak. Do they? Yes, cash sure does. Do they? We're, okay. We're we're split. We we do time of use in some accounts, and some are actually at market rates. So yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll pull something together to give the committee. Yeah, the just a rough. Yeah, straight something close. Mm -hmm. You know, those savings would have to be spread throughout the, the whole north or north, north, north yeah. yeah. Okay, no further uh, roundtable discussion for this evening. I know we're drawing close to the six o'clock hour. Okay, we've already we've gone through our, our next steps. We've uh, going to get uh, feedback from. Uh, the, uh, Committee chairs, back in by the uh, 12th, 12th uh, for a meeting on the 19th. And the next meeting will be February 19th at 4 o'clock in the Council Chambers. Item 12.1 adjournment. The North Huron Bridge and Dam Committee uh, agreed that being no further business before the committee, the meeting be hereby adjourned at uh, it goes 5 58. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trick? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't able to do that. How are you starting? Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> 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 <laughs>